Good afternoon, everyone. This is Eric Anderson, President of the Corps, and welcome to our business forum. Um, it used to be called the Business Forum Luncheon, but hopefully you're able to uh, bring your own and enjoy lunch while uh, you can participate in uh, learning a little bit more about what's going on in the local economy. Um, you know, we've had to pivot a little bit uh, at SEDCOR to change our forum lunch just to a web-based uh, discussion. But our goal is the same, to share stories, uh, news, and resources with the mid Willamette Valley business community. Uh, for this month, we decided to program a panel of local businesses who have retooled and pivoted themselves uh, to manufacture um, PPE, PPE or um, uh, personal protection equipment, um, both to share their stories as well as to celebrate their ingenuity and uh, the community spirit of these businesses. Um, you know, making that decision to pivot the new lines of production is, uh, can be a complicated thing. And uh, we're really thankful that these folks had the vision and the ability to uh, take advantage of that and, and move forward. So we're excited to share their stories with you. Um, as you may know, we've also been trying to promote uh, these four and um, probably about a dozen or so other businesses through our, um, our portal on our website, uh, uh, PPE directory at uh, sedcore.com. And um, this allows uh, both businesses and uh, local organizations in the region here or beyond to uh, look at what's being uh, produced by the communities, uh, the county uh, businesses here, and uh, make direct contact with them and talk about the needs that you have around uh, keeping employees and, uh, and others uh, safe uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and um, also it gives us an opportunity not just to thank these businesses for doing their share, but also to uh, thank the Oregon um, Manufacturing Extension Partnership, uh, OMAP, one of our valued partners in uh, our, our work here at the SEDCOR. Um, OMAP worked with us really early on as part of the team to help uh, um, many of these businesses and others secure the right uh, um, supplies that might be needed for them to uh, to go into uh, this new line, as well as providing a lot of other businesses uh, resources around how to protect workforce, how to deal with distance uh, requirements and other things on the, on the workfloor, et cetera. So um, we're really pleased to have OMEP here and um, we'll start things off with uh, um, Mike Benier, um, who is the uh, Vice President of Client Engagement for OMEP and a good partner with SEDCOR. So uh, I'll hand it off to you, Mike. Thanks, Eric. And I mean, I wanna echo a couple of things that Eric said is, you know, through this whole COVID-19, um, you know, uncertain times, uh, I think bring out the best, you know, in a lot of people and, and you know, a lot of organizations. And uh, prior to, you know, COVID, uh, OMEP and SEDCOR had a great partnership, but, um, I know from OMEP's perspective, uh, that partnership has grown even greater and uh, is having a bigger impact on manufacturing there in the Mid Valley. And, and we're very, very appreciative, you know, of, uh, you know, of that partnership. Also companies like, you know, are gonna be featured today. Um, you know, they're, they're a great example of the Oregon manufacturing ecosystem. And, and I've, I, I have believed this and, and it's been uh, verified that, that, that throughout the, um, the, the uh, innovative nature and the um, attitude to get it done it is been evident you know, within each one of these companies and um, have helped Oregon in general you know, navigate this, this situation. So um, all four of these companies are definitely on, 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 you know, inspiring. So I wanted just to, you know, mention that. Um, I'm going to briefly just cover kind of who, who OMEP is to companies out there that, um, that don't know about us. Um, OMEP, if you want to move to the next slide, Michael. Um, uh, OMEP is the Oregon Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, this is our uh, mission statement that OMEP works side by side with Oregon manufacturers to help build uh, uh, successful businesses. There's really two elements of this that, that I like to point out. And, and one is the side by side. 
is we are not a consulting firm that we go into manufacturing companies and, and that we do stuff to companies. We do stuff with companies in partnership, shoulder to shoulder, side by side. And that's very important, uh, uh, you know, within, with, within the approach that, that, you know, OMEP takes. The next thing is, is, is the successful business. We want to understand how individual manufacturing companies uh, define success for them. And success is beyond what their income statement says, their, their balance sheet, cash flow. It's really how they specifically define success. And we want to partner with them to help them um, you know, uh, uh, you know, achieve that success. Uh, next slide, Michael. Um, so, so who's OMEP? We're a not-for-profit management consulting firm. We're a blend between private and public funds. We receive some funding through the Department of Commerce, NIST, and, and, and the MEP program. We, we receive some funding through uh, Business Oregon and then our um, client um, uh, fees. Uh, we have 23 staff you know, statewide. You'll notice on the Oregon map, we have offices all the way you know, up and down the you know, I-5 corridor and then over in Bend at, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, as well. The map to the right is the, obviously the you know, United States. There, there is an MEP center in every single state. Uh, yeah, they may be structured a you know, little bit different, but we all function independently. What the huge benefit to that is, is that we have a nationwide network of resources that we can leverage in, in certain expertise, cert, uh, uh, certain specialties, in supplier scouting, which uh, Jasmine will talk about uh, on, on, um, you know, in a minute. This is a huge value add for clients that, that OMEP has, has the privilege to work with is is the national network. Uh, the next slide, Michael. Uh, so um, really how to get started with OMEP is the on-site uh, no charge assessment. We actually use our federal funding and this is where we can come on site and we can work with companies to really evaluate where they're at, what their pain points are, what their needs, and then we develop a um, well, and we, and we provide unbiased feedback and, you know, improvement opportunities, you know, right throughout that, um, you know, assessment process, but they get a scope of work, which is a roadmap and, and it's customized to them. It's, you know, actionable steps for growth and then for, uh, uh, you know, improvement. They also gain a, you know, understanding of both um, financial as well as operational, you know, possibilities um, for their business. Um, next slide, Michael. So I think we missed one slide in there that I wanted just to touch on quickly. And uh, um, one is kind of OMEP's approach. And that is the, that, we, that we take all of our solutions methodologies and we bend them around our client need. They become um, their IP. The other thing is that we believe in a drip irrigation um, uh, delivery model. So that is at the client's pace. It's, it's, it, it's how their organization can, can actually absorb the information and then implement it. Um, and then it's the shoulder to shoulder approach, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, we, we wanna be working with leadership and then we wanna be out, out on the shop floor. Um, the next slide, Michael, hopefully is there about, the, about our different areas that we provide services in. It's manufacturing operations, uh, as in a service offering, y'all can see all of the different um, program areas and, and then specific programs, business financials and strategy. So it's your financial understanding, growth services and, 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 and then strategy, and then workforce solutions. That's really anything to do with people. That's your recruiting, onboarding, training, leadership, culture, um, succession planning, um, um, you know, and so on. Um, you know, if anybody has any needs, please feel free to reach out to, you know, OMAP. Um, um, we would love to talk to you and partner with you. I want to hand it off to Jasmine now. Jasmine is our uh, senior marketing manager here, and she led OMAP's um, initiative going into COVID in regards to uh, supplier scouting. And I wanted her to share uh, some of that information and then uh, introduce the panel for today.
Yeah, hey, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. And um, I'll kind of run through this really quickly. I think, you know, like most um, folks, as we kind of saw what was happening with COVID, um, we gathered together and tried to figure out, you know, the best way to serve the manufacturing community here in Oregon. Um, and one of the, you know, outcomes of that is we did put together, in case anyone is interested, a um, kind of a COVID workplace safety um, guidebook and an in-depth assessment um, that you can find on our website. It's free of charge to use. Um, and it's really designed pulling information from OSHA guidelines, CDC, Oregon Health Authority, so that uh, you don't have to sort through a, a million different, you know, articles and try to figure out what to do. We tried to uh, get all of that information in one place um, and really give some guidance on how to safely, you know, practice social distancing and, and other um, sanitizing um uh, methodologies. In terms of supplier scouting as it comes to, you know, PPE, uh, there are a couple th of, of groups that I was a part of. One um, at the national level, as Mike mentioned, uh, we are part of the MEP national network um, and therefore have a great, you know, kind of um, state connection with local small and mid-sized manufacturers all across the United States. And so that group put together a nationwide supplier scouting initiative and really worked um, to get immediate needs met from domestic manufacturers all over the US. Um, and that group was reporting out to the White House on a daily basis. So it's kind of great to be able to have um, a connection, you know, directly to um, the White House and helping them to understand the importance of um, domestic manufacturing in a response to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is still something that is, that we are happy to help with that the NIST National Network is still doing. Um, we regularly field, you know, requests from manufacturers if they are looking for someone to help them make a part produce, you know, maybe they just need like the metal nose brands for, you know, an N95 mask, for example, we can help to source those through the MEP national network and there's no cost for that. So if anyone has questions about that or you're looking for a part and can't find it, um, need materials, I'm happy to put those requests out um, to NIST. On the local um, side of things, we were able to partner with some incredible organizations, including Builds Oregon, um, PNDC, Business Oregon, Oregon Bioscience Association, SBDC, and many more economic development groups, too many to list, um, and really start to get um, uh, connections with manufacturers who are interested in making PPE, who are already in the process of pivoting to make PPE, um, and who wanted more information on it. And really, um, my role is just trying to be a connector and trying to help uh, connect the need with the demand. Part of what came out of that was um, Supply Connector Oregon. You can go to supplyconnector.org slash Oregon, and you can find a list of um, Oregon-based companies that are offering PPE. I know everyone on this call is um, in that database. And then also a spot for if you need a PPE, and that includes, you know, it's beyond just masks and gowns. It also includes, you know, sanitization um, equipment, um, you know, anything you can think of that's kind of connected to that. Um, and so huge props to Business Oregon, especially for helping to stand that up and get that going so quickly. And I know, of course, um, SEDCOR also put together their uh, even more local um, database for just such a purpose, uh, which is fantastic. I know there's other groups around the state that have done the same thing. So I feel privileged to even play just a tiny role in, in um, connecting those folks. And in terms of, um, you know, the companies that are here today, we've at least played some kind of a connection or facilitating connections role with, you know, three of the four of the folks today specifically with Northwest um, Alpine, we've supported some of their quick ramping up to be able to produce masks and just help to problem solve so they could get going um, quickly in providing those much needed materials. So again, you know, echoing Mike's comments, it's a huge privilege to be a part of a group of such 
um, I would say heroic companies that are really rising to the call to um, help out the community when it needs it most. And so um, with that, I will introduce our panelists today are Mariah Robbins from ADEC, Bill Amos from Northwest Alpine, uh, Naoki Kuze from St. Corsair, and Russ Monk from Watershed. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so we've got some prepared questions for the panel that we'll start with. And then uh, once again, as a reminder, we uh, do have a Q&A function on, um, on Zoom here for folks that are probably by now very familiar with it. So um, please uh, submit questions. We already have one on there for uh, uh, later in the discussion. Um, but for the panel, uh, we're here to talk about PPE and your experience there. But please introduce yourself and also tell us um, about your business and your usual line of work. Uh, what do you produce and who do you sell it to? And we'll start, we'll go in alphabetical order here and start with ADEC. So uh, Mariah, please. Thank you, Eric. My name is Mariah Robbins. I'm the Vice President of the Global People and Culture Team at ADEC. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with what we are and what we do, we are a um, family-owned company, one of the largest um, dental equipment manufacturers in the world. Um, we have our world headquarters just here in Newburgh, and then we also have facilities in uh, a very small facility that we actually just acquired a, a year ago this week in uh, St. Louis, and then we have a uh, facilities in the UK, Australia, and in China as well. So um, what we produce, and I think we have might have some slides in here to just kind of show you a picture so that give you an idea. When you go to the dentist, um, you're hopefully sitting in an ADEC chair, so we produce the large capital equipment for the dental office. So PPE was not an area that we specialized in, although the field that we worked in uses PPE and gloves and masks and things prior to COVID. Um, but we really do the equipment that um, really supports kind of the, the surrounding areas of the operatory, including the furniture, the chairs, the lights, and the stools that doctors sit in. So um, ADEC, I think we have one more slide just to kind of show you the breadth of where we're, oh, nope, sorry, it was a different one. <laughs> So um, we, we really have kind of, um, there it is, we have um, just to kind of show you the breadth of where we are at in our state and also globally, um, the first picture up there is really just a, um, a nonprofit clinic that really helps serve underserved children in, um, in the Portland area. So we donate a lot of our equipment to um, help charities and, and global um, folks around the world that are really trying to get dentistry to um, people who are underserved or don't have insurance. And then the other, uh, picture some of you may have toured that's actually at OHSU so you'll recognize the Portland uh, skyline there that's the dental school we have locally and then we also um, have a lot of um, federal and, and government contracts from the White House and the Kremlin on two different sides and then um, on all the naval naval ships so we have quite a spread of kind of where our equipment is used um, and we um, are very proud to be family owned and focus on our people first but uh, you'll see that one of the trademarks of ADEC is the fact that we're just very proud proud of our, um, our products and our people, and um, that shows in kind of the, the way that they put their heart into the quality of their manufacturing process. Thank you, Mariah. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you're here to join us. Thank um, you. Bill, how, tell us about Northwest Alpine. Yeah, my name is Bill Amos, and I'm the founder of two companies, uh, Northwest Alpine, um, which is a climbing apparel brand focused on um, kind of outdoor apparel, uh, high-end outdoor apparel for, for winter climbing. Uh, and then Kachatna Apparel Manufacturing, which is our manufacturing side where we do production for our own brand. And then uh, contract manufacturing, cut and sew for uh, a number of other brands, mostly in the athletic and outdoor industry. Great, thank you, Bill. And thanks for being here. Uh, Naoki, tell us about uh, St. Cousair. Hi, uh, my name is Naoki Kuse of St. Gazelle, uh, and we are the company to, to produce high uh, quality food and beverage products. And we manufacture sauces, dressings, apple cider vinegar drinks, jams, and, and many more. And our customers are, you know, individual consumer, and our, you know, uh, immediate, you know, customer is somebody like uh, Costco, uh, and our, you know, other local retail stores. Uh, we are also distributing our products in Japan as well. And uh, our products are available in our online stores 
And currently, you know, we open up our facility parking space uh, to, you know, uh, for customer to, you know, stop in by and, you know, purchase a product uh, through a uh, drive-through system. Um, so uh, that is who we are. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you for being here. Um, and finally, uh, Russ, tell us about Watershed. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Watershed is about a 35-year-old company specializing in rain gear. Um, your public safety, your, like Portland Fire and uh, Oregon State Police, uh, that's one aspect of the rain gear is the actual high-end Gore-Tex flavor. And then timber industry, fisheries, and ag uh, rain gear is a big part of what we do as well, uh, anchored here in Salem. Thanks, Russ, and, and you're uh, also the cover star of the uh, <laughs> Enterprise magazine for the summer, so uh, congratulations on that distinction. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm honored, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just, you know, we, uh, we think enough of this topic to uh, also dedicate a good part of our um, um, summer edition of that, so thank you. Many of these businesses are included in that as well. Um, next question for the panel. Um, you know, the world has changed a lot over the past few months. We've certainly seen it here at SEDCOR, and I think everybody's experienced it in many different ways. Um, before you decided to pivot into the PPE, tell us how your business was impacted by the coronavirus pandemic and uh, any, of the, any market disruptions that may have resulted from that. And I'll start again with Mariah. Oh, we got, I think we're on mute, Mariah. Sorry, there. <laughs> As you might imagine, being a, a discretionary capital equipment company with an economic downturn, our business tends to be pretty reactive right away because it's something that people can choose to not purchase and it's big expenses. Um, so we saw an immediate downturn. Um, about 70% of our business within a couple of weeks uh, kind of fell off a cliff. Uh, unfortunately, that was, it, it did impact some of our employees. I've got a couple slides to kind of model what we did and how we responded to that. But um, unfortunately, we had about 100 people laid off almost immediately uh, with this uh, response. And that was, we tried to do as many job preservation activities as we possibly could, which PPE is something I'll talk about later that that was very helpful for us. Um, but then we also had, um, and this is kind of a, a building slide, we had about, um, uh, several hundred who also are now participating in the work share program. So for those of you who haven't taken advantage of that, of reducing between 20 and 40% of their hours. So they're partially getting unemployment for the hours that they aren't working, but they're able to still keep full benefits and full PTO accrual and able to kind of keep um, that that work piece of their livelihood. And so they're still considered a regular full-time employee um, with reduced hours. And then we've had uh, several of those work share participants as well as others furloughed. So most of our workforce furloughed um, for at least two weeks, some up to 30 days. And then we, um, the rest of the, the remaining of the group that was not included in either the layoffs, the work share or the furlough program, really the only thing that's left is our um, director team and our uh, executive team and all of that group took um, pay cuts that will just be sustained through at least the remainder of this year and possibly longer. So, you know, it was obviously, you know, we saw some downturn and, and um, but I'm happy to report that things are getting better now that our uh, customers are back to work with the economy reopening. Um, we've really started to see much of a, 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 a re rebound in our business, but also the fact that we've been able to sustain folks working through the PPE program and other opportunities. So it's created two new product lines for us actually during this crisis that are responding to, um, to protective equipment. Right, thank you, Mariah. Um, Bill, how about with uh, Northwest Alpine? Yeah, so um, we saw on the contract side, especially with kind of our consumer facing brands that we work with, um, their sales were, were hit pretty, um, pretty hard in March. And um, there's definitely kind of a, a reaction to that and a lot of canceled orders. So there was some, definitely some uh, concern there, um, but we were lucky, um, you know, to, to have the, the PPE um, stuff starts. We had a, a Portland company contact us almost immediately after um, uh, kind of the crisis, uh, the shutdowns were happening and everything. And um, we started making masks for them. So we were able to, uh, to fill all that capacity and then ended up uh, 
actually hiring a bunch of people. So um, kind of uh, we're, we're lucky in that respect. And we, we did hear from, um, you know, while a lot of the retailers and restaurants, particularly kind of almost overnight lost 100% uh, revenue, um, you know, many of the uh, surprising number of businesses um, actually, you know, gained almost immediately as a result also. And you know, so we had some mixed uh, experience in the food processing business. So, uh, Naoki, um, how was it for, um, for St. Cousser? Okay, um, so we were aware of, you know, COVID-19 risk in, you know, summer in January, but we were still quite optimistic about the situation. And we started to see news of what is going on across the nation. And we uh, create, you know, we created internal COVID-19 policy in, in fairly, you know, early uh, stage. And, you know, but the real, you know, like economical hit was, you know, a couple of, you know, our major, you know, uh, customer, you know, customers, you know, they, they called to cancel the purchase order. And, and you know, we, we really realized that uh, it is happening uh, to us, you know, as a result of, you know, pandemic. And it, it was, you know, very uh, quite scary, you know, moment. I can imagine. Thank you. And, and Russ, what was it uh, happening for Watershed at that time? Uh, when it rains, we're busy. When the sun comes out, we're not. So <laughs> if we picked the perfect time to have a, a pandemic, this would be a good shot for us. Um, what we have is because we are an essential business for firefighters or public safety and the military work that we do, um, because we were able to keep our doors open with uh, that, that need, uh, we actually had customers lay in new orders. So in a weird way, you know, kind of was a bounce the other direction for us, it went up. And then we added the PPE line. And with that, we've added about 10 people inside the building and about 30 people outside the building uh, actively involved in, in the PPE manufacturing with us. Um, it's kind of a strange day. We're actually uh, trying to find people in a lot of times when, when the world is trying to not, not find people. So it's been great. And we should put a plug in for our partners at Willamette Workforce Partnership, because I know we've uh, heard that from a couple other businesses that they were having trouble actually finding people these days. So um, yep. we've been trying to make some referrals up to our, uh, to our neighbors and partners there at Willamette. Um, uh, and, and for, um, I guess, interestingly, we've got with uh, Watershed and Northwest Alpine, you're both already in the apparel industry, but what new um, challenges did you face when you were uh, moving into the PPE production? Um, start with Bill. Um, so we're kind of used to making fairly, uh, fairly complex and, and high quality products. Um, so really transitioning to um you know mostly mass and isolation gowns wasn't really uh that difficult for us um just because the the construction of those items is is pretty straightforward um and you know we have a lot of really really skilled uh machine operators and um so it, yeah it wasn't wasn't a huge huge issue um I would say one of the things that it's, um, you know, so we're super focused on quality and everything and PPE doesn't necessarily have to be the same quality as, uh, you know, a $400 pair of pants or you know, a $700 jacket or whatever. So um, understanding what kind of can be run faster to get more, uh, more product out and doesn't necessarily have to, to look beautiful um, that's kind of been challenging for us. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, Russ, with Watershed, uh, how about for you as far as uh, retooling for PPE from your usual uh, production? So making large body parts is what we're good at right now. So the, the, the initial jump was not that big of a jump. What was the unique part of this was you go from making a $300 or $400 jacket that a firefighter would use for 10 years to making a disposable gown that gets thrown away after one use. Um, we at this point have purchased 190 miles times two, so 380 miles of material with another 180,000 
uh, 180 more miles coming. So what the biggest change was is how do you process by the mile, not by the gallon? And so it, it's been a really unique trying to find space and storage and, and how to shoehorn in that much mass and then start accelerating the production. Um, we, we're making about 5,000 gallons a day right now um, and climbing to 8,000 here shortly. Um, that's a little bit different than uh, making uh, you know, 30 uh, coats a day or something like that. So it was a wholesale revamping of the mentality and the processing and the equipment and the, and the material flow. Um, that was a steep leaning learning curve that we had to learn. So it wasn't a choice. You just have to do it. So I'm, I'm proud of our team for that. Um, it's a whole different factory. About 40% of our factory is now retooled into PPE, um, including a swing shift that, that went live during the summer months as well. Wow, interesting. Um, so for our other two businesses, you weren't in the in this uh, kind of line of work to begin with. So I'm curious. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mariah. What was uh, your company's retooling like for PPE? Yeah, um, similar to Bill, we have people who are used to making you know quality equipment that costs thousands of dollars. So transitioning to something that's disposable after a day, that quality mindset's a little <laughs> bit different, right? So that we had to um, think about that from the perspective. But we also um, tran had to think about making small things, right? We made big, big equipment. So. I think the slide that's up is really talking about our response of what we've kind of done as the workforce to be able to keep people working. And that's really going to, but um, yeah, thank you. The, uh, we called this Project Matilda, and it was really cr to manufacture the Papper Shield. So if you're not familiar with those, you can see the picture up in the um, upper right-hand corner is really a, um, a helmet that's not disposable, and then the Papper Shield attaches to the forehead of that, and it's, it's basically a reusable piece of plastic that then um, the, there's a, a film that attaches to the gown. And so these were something that um, really was um, in ICUs and different uh, medical facilities for treating infected patients were running really short and in some cases, they were reusing them um, because they wanted to be able to obviously protect their employees and weren't able to get supply. So we were able to pretty quickly pivot and um, thanks to, to SEDCOR and um, we really, we had uh, partnerships. I think we, you know, we had already mentioned from Jasmine uh, getting supplies. I mean, that was a, definitely something that was a challenge early on. So we had got some great help from OMEP to be able to get the plastics and things that we needed. But the transition for us was really about thinking about one, where are we going to put this space? And then how are we going to teach people quickly how to pivot from making big capital equipment to making a smaller uh, reuse or uh, disposable item? Um, and then how do we set up the kind of that, that facility and that, that distribution? And we also don't sell direct. So this was something, right? We sell through a dealership network. So how do we get this to um, the, the groups that need it? And that was through a partnership really with Legacy Health here locally to get them the, the materials that they needed. Um, so on the very bottom, that little, um, the, the longer rectangular um, slide has a video in there. So if you want to kind of scroll over it and hit play, you can kind of show people what our manufacturing facility looks like for the area that we're using to produce the Papper Shields. Um, it'll show you kind of what the, what the setup looks like. If it doesn't play, we can go on. <laughs> you kind of have to hover over it to play it. See if Michael's able to get that going. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to get that to play. My bad. That's okay. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Naoki, how about with uh, Saint Couser getting into the the um, sanitizer business? Okay, so um, I received an email from you know Abisher of Sedocor. If there is any availability of you know PPE that we can supply, and you know at the same time I I heard and watched the news of this, you know, sad, you know, situation in the whole, whole country. And, and, and that time I recall my, my experience, you know, uh, our company came from Japan uh, in 2017 and, and the, the, the American and, you know, Oregonian are so generally welcome and help us uh, when we started up, you know, our, our, our base here in Newburgh, uh, Oregon. And I clearly uh, remember, you know, uh, you know this, and I wanted to, you know, give back to the community somehow, using our business and uh, and facility. Uh, I knew we can physically make a hand sanitizer using our facility, 
uh, with, you know, with a bottling machine, which can produce about 15,000 jars per day, um, you know, and, and, and however, you know, my only concern was that, that uh, as we were not certified as hand sanitizer manufacturer, uh, which is far different from, you know, our food manufacturing license, then I share, you know, my, um, my idea to Abishar uh, with my concern. And she quickly responded that uh, uh, with, with very positive comments and let me know that the FDA is offering a temporary hand sanitizer manufacturing license to a company like us uh, because of the high demand in a serious you know, health crisis with uh, guidance of manufacturing procedure and recipe. Um, then, you know, um, I share the idea uh, of, of manufacturing hand sanitizer with my team. Uh, at first, you know, they were a little confused because it is completely different things, you know, as, as we do. But as I explained uh, in detail about the project, uh, they jumped in the project with a very positive attitude and, you know, but uh, our biggest challenge was the time. And normally, you know, we take at least three months to launch the new product to the market. And we knew we needed to, to do this very quickly to help out the community. And our project, you know, started on March 21st, uh, right after the executive order. And our first production was on April 10th, which was only two weeks uh, from our project uh, started from, you know, Zello. So our team worked extremely hard making a, you know, very brave and instance decision. Uh, so, you know, the time was the, the very challenging, you know, element uh, for us. Glad you brought that up because that's, you know, we, we, we're here in now July and it seems like it's, you know, been a long, long time. But one of the things that, uh, you know, really striking to me of, of uh, all these businesses is that ability to move so quickly um, and get something to, to market into a new market. Um, it, it uh, you know, it, it seems like a long time ago, but that those period between the you know, third week of March and, and the beginning of April, a lot of activity happened and it all did a lot of work in that uh, time period. Um, another question for the whole panel now that you're all in the kind of the PPE business here, but um, how do you see going forward balancing, you know, what you're doing with PPE with um, the other products that you produce? And I'll start again with uh, Mariah. Yeah, we actually will continue, uh, not necessarily with Papper Shields, but we are, we'll transition and assume that it's probably okay to share this. To, um, obviously, in the dental field, there's now some concern and things are going to change, right, and medically of what's, um, ex what is acceptable for aerosols and particles um, based on any sort of airborne illness. So dentists have never worn shields unless it was really a high risk situation. They've worn face covering. So you probably have never gone to the dentist and seen them wearing a full plastic face covering, um, but they will be actually required to use those and, and transition to having more protective equipment. So there's actually, it's different because the face shield that you've seen that we were producing for the medical field is top down from the dental industry. It actually connects at your neck and comes up because it's protecting the patient and the um, and the the dentist from you know the aerosols that could go between them so it's you know really pushing things into the air instead of to the ground because it would be um, putting particles directly into the patient's face. Um, and, and likewise for the dentist. So that is one piece. And then we also have launched in the um, during COVID a cover your cough station for um, folks who are entering a the, the lobby. Um, and it's basically a self-contained tower that has masks, sanitizer, um, a gar tissues, and then a garbage can so that you can keep all of those germs and everything right in one place. If, so as people walk into the lobby, they can kind of grab what they need to make sure that they're keeping the rest of the folks sitting and waiting healthy and safe. So um, I don't foresee, especially with um, what we've been watching with uh, kind of occupational health and safety in the dental industry, that um, anything that's related to protective equipment in the dental field going away as a, a business for us in the future. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks, Mariah. Um, Bill, how about with Northwest Alpine? Are you in the PPE business permanently now? Uh, I believe that we are. So um, our plan, actually, we're launching um, another brand that's specifically 
PP oriented. Uh, and then um, we also have, um, so mostly what we've been doing um, production wise is reusable isolation gowns. Um, so we're continuing to make those and seeing quite a bit of the demand. Uh, I think we're losing your uh, connection a little bit, Bill. And then we're also. Maybe we'll move from Bill here. I think I've got his uh, screen frozen here. So maybe I'll. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I owe you the, the same question. Are you looking at uh, offering this on a full-time basis? Oh, we have, you're on uh, mute, Naoki. Thank so, you. So, um, as I mentioned previously, we lost, you know, quite a few uh, production uh, days due to the cancellation of, you know, from a couple of big accounts because because of the pandemic. So we use uh, those days for, you know, producing hand sanitizer. Um, and, you know, one of our uh, primitive goal of this project, other than helping out, you know, the community was to, to create the jobs uh, to, to our employees uh, as much as we can. And at the same time, you know, um, we need to have a revenue uh, to, you know, uh, for us to keep on going our business, uh, going through this difficult time. Thank you. Um, Bill, I think we, we lost you about uh, 30 away into your answer. So we'll go back to you. Where, uh, where did I fall off there? You, you were talking about the new, uh, the new line. And uh, then at least for my connection, I started to break up a little bit going into the new line. Okay. So, um, We've uh, basically been producing um, reusable or washable isolation gowns. Um, oh, all right. Wasn't sure if I was getting getting uh, kicked out again. Um, and so our intention is is to continue to do that. Um, and we've been seeing you know quite a bit of demand uh, for those still. Um, and we have orders for almost uh, half a million. Um, gowns over the next uh, five or six months. Um, so that's going to keep us busy. Um, so the other thing we're doing is adding um, a surgical mask machine that's going to allow us to produce around uh, a million masks a month. Um, so that's going to be uh, pretty awesome to have here in Oregon. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I kind of want to, to get on, on my soapbox for a minute here. Um, and because this is something that since kind of the crisis started, I've been thinking about a lot. Um, there's a really good article in the New York Times on Sunday that I would recommend everybody uh, look up. It's the title's China Dominates Medical Supplies and This Outbreak in the Next. Uh, and essentially outlines all things that, um, that China has done to support their, their PPE industry. Um, you know, you imagine lands, factories, and subsidies, and, uh, you know, making hospitals buy locally produced goods. Um, I mean, so essentially, it's created this, this really low cost industry in China. Um, and for the last 20 years, we've kind of um, ceded that industry to them. Um, and I think that that's a big problem uh, that, that needs to be addressed. I mean, having the kind of authoritarian country doesn't share democratic ideals, having a stranglehold on the production of those products is, is pretty problematic. So I think that, well, you know, companies like ours are, are trying to do what we can um, to, to respond to the crisis long-term. I think that, you know, we aren't seeing the level of investment that, that we need to become self-sufficient. So I was just reading an article this morning that Germany um, has identified the need for for 7 billion masks a year for internal consumption. Um, and they have a plan in place to have that capacity ready uh, by 2021, so next year. 
So we have four times the population of Germany and, and you know, extrapolating that out, that's 28 billion masks a year. Um, and that's obviously a massive number. And that's gonna require a large investment, um, particularly in raw materials production. So in the N95 masks that you hear a lot about and in surgical masks, the filtration material is called melt-blown polypropylene. Um, and that has been in very short supply because most of the factories are in China and they stopped exporting it um, to us. So there's a few factories left in the U.S. that do it, and we're lucky enough to be connected with, uh, with one of them. So we have a supply there. But in order to, to really fill the need for what we, um, you know, for, for what we really need, there's going to have to be, um, you know, many more Mel Blown lines set up. Um, and I think that that this investment largely isn't happening um, because we know that ultimately we can't compete against the um, companies that are subsidized by the Chinese government, um, companies that don't have to make a profit and they've been allowed to dump their, uh, their products onto our market and oftentimes they're sold at less than cost. Um, so basically I think we need in this country an industrial policy that supports manufacturing these products here. I have no idea what that looks like. Uh, maybe some Buy American rules, something similar to the Barry Amendment, um, progressively stricter limits on imports until uh, domestic supply can meet demand. But until there's some sort of, of um, protection for these uh, for these companies in this manufacturing, uh, it's not you know it's not going to happen, and we're going to be stuck in a similar situation to what what we've been in for the last few months. Um, and but I don't think that you know there's no reason that that the Mid Willamette Valley can't become a major producer of these products, um, you know, given the appropriate appropriate policy that you know that will protect the manufacturers and. Um, yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. One, we did share in the in the chat box here a link to the New York Times article you mentioned. So uh, if folks want to take a look at that, you know, I think that gives SEDCOR some good direction as far as, you know, working with, uh, we've had, you know, really good um, communication through the Regional Solutions Office of, uh, you, know, you know, Governor Brown um, as a region and um, our federal delegation representatives have been participating in that as well. So I think this is a really great topic for us to be talking about. Maybe we uh, arrange this kind of special discussion with uh, you know, folks like the people here on the panel to kind of talk about where we go from here. Um, what we, you know, both from as a state and uh, federally, I think uh, you raised some good points, Bill. Um, and, and certainly from the perspective of, uh, of supply chain um, challenges and uh, you know, future planning. I, I know that's something that OMEP has also been quite involved in, um, you know, recognizing that those are issues. And, and we've certainly seen that as an opportunity, potentially even in food uh, regionally, looking at food supply chain and, and uh, food security in the future too. Um, Russ, I want to be sure we reach you on this one. Um, as far as it sounds like you, Watershed has certainly uh, uh, geared up for increased PPE production in the future. Yeah, we, we are designing this production as a bell curve. Um, somewhere along the way, we'll have to pull the ripcord and, and fold it back down. A lot of the military programs that we have have a defined life, uh, so many units, uh, so much of a time. And so we're designing it that way as well. Um, we think we've got about an 18-month bell that, that will be really strong uh, and, and much needed. And mirroring what the, the gentleman from Northwest Alpine said, uh, we look at the raw materials as a strategic national uh, item, just like the oil reserve, the steel reserve, things like that. If you don't have raw materials, you cannot make product. And so PPE is always viewed as a, as a finished good. Um, we look at it as a raw material and getting that raw material was really tough. So on our gown side, we actually invented our own fabric um, and the first truckloads already landed here uh, because we couldn't get that. We were competing with all the other states and the federal government and the other countries. So we, we stepped out of the traditional industries and invented our own. And I think that is what we'll need to do as a country regionally and nationally to be able to solve this is look at the raw materials and build strategic stockpiles so that if we ever have to you know uh, throw up the flare 
we, we've got it already in arm's reach and we can engage. Um, we were caught flat-footed as a country on this and, and I wish that that was not the case, but that is the case. So we need you know, strategic thinking of how to never do that again. Yeah, good point, Russ, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions that have been offered up, so I'll just ask one last one for the panel here and just uh, we've referred to this a little bit, but maybe if you have anything to add, as you look to the future, um, what the next six to 12 months look like? I know there's not a lot of uh, easy things to predict these days, but um, just wondering what it looks like for your business and your industry. And we'll start with Mariah. That's a hard question to answer. Yeah. I wish I knew if this was going to be. <laughs> I hope it's not a W. That's what I keep hoping for. Um, I mean, we've had experienced um, great growth since the dental industry has been reopened and patients are going back into the office. Um, if we continue to see rise in cases and we pull back in the phases of opening and our dental offices and our customers essentially are not able to practice, um, we could see another downturn. Um, I'm really hoping that what we're seeing and kind of the growth and the recovery in our business is, um, is sustained, um, but we're being prepared and proactive of what different ways that we can um, pivot and look at different uh, lines. But like everyone on the call has just shared a lot of dead ends that we've run into and looking at additional uh, products that we could manufacture and we've got the capabilities to, I mean, we we have upholstery sewers, we have many sewing machines, lots of different cutters and things. There's a lot that we could make, but we can't get the raw materials to make it. Um, so that's kind of, you know, there's a, a, an area where, you know, we, we have ideas and we, um, but we do hope and so that we will see the sustain, sustained growth that we've seen over the last uh, three to four weeks. Um, and that that's an indicator that the economy is starting to recover. Yeah, I think I appreciate the fact that it's not an easy question, but that was a good answer. <laughs> uh, Bill, how about for Northwest Alpine? What do you see the next six to 12 months looking like? Yeah, so I guess I'm not um, super bullish on the return of consumer spending. Um, so, I mean, I think for us, our focus is mainly going to be on, on PPE and growing the PPE business. Um, I mean, I think long term, the domestic sewing ind industry is gonna is going to kind of benefit from the changes that are happening now. And I mean, we're already seeing a lot of demand because the supply um, of factories is so low in this country that um, you know I think it's only gonna going to going to be more in demand. Great, thank you. How about Naoki? Well, that, that is really a tough question, but uh, uh, we are, <laughs> tough you know, questions now, you know <laughs> yeah, we are, we are now, you know, try to focus on our, uh, you know, our business as a uh, food manufacturing. And we are now, you know, try to develop, you know, new items for, you know, launching sometimes in the summer, um, you know, and fall and winter. Um, and in my industry, you know, retail, packaged, you know, shelf life, stable food, produ food products are in very high demand, uh, especially in, in this situation where people are spending a lot of time uh, at home with the family doing home cooking. So, you know, we are very happy uh, to be part of your, your breakfast and, and dining table and contribute to your smile uh, with our great products. And that is our, you know, really a focus and, and our mission. That's great. Good, good spin to put on it. Um, and Russ, how about for Watershed? Um, we actually have to balance our normal business because if the bubble does pop, you want to make sure that what you do for a living continues. And so that's a balance that way. In the next 12 months, we have about a million and a half gowns to make. And we have capacity right now to make about 750,000. So I actually have to cookie cut and add more horsepower to what I'm doing as we speak. And uh, the, according to Oregon Emergency Management, we cannot make enough product here in Oregon. So uh, good on everybody to being part of this. It's, it's been an honor and it's been fun to be part of this. Um, we believe a million and a half gallons can be made here in, in Salem and not counting what Bill's gonna add to it. Um, I would love to see this become a PPE hub of, of Oregon and the Northwest and maybe even the West Coast. Um, if we can all bring our horsepower together to make something like that happen. I think you're giving us certainly some ideas to move forward at SEDCOR and trying to address just that, Russ. Thank you. 
one of the uh, things, oh, sorry. Oops, sorry, go ahead, Mariah. I was just gonna say one thing that I should have mentioned, and I'm sure it's on all of our minds, especially with taking extra precautions. The biggest thing that keeps me up at night over the next six to 12 months isn't so much orders coming in, it's keeping our employees healthy and safe uh, and outbreaks, because that's what's gonna shut us down the fastest is a spread um, throughout our employee workplace. So what precautions we've been taking and we're going over the top with that to try to make sure that, you know, we're really uh, making sure that people stay safe from the distancing. I have my entire team <laughs> Out walking around in every building every day checking and, and making sure that people are understanding the physical distancing and staying behind barriers temperature screenings every morning which people don't love sitting and waiting at a tent you know in their cars as they're driving up to get their temperature taken but it's just an important protocol and then um, you know uh, wearing face coverings we do um, a video every single week we call it Mondays with Mariah and Marv our um, COO Mar Marv Nelson we we have a video broadcast and I'm sure people are sick of hearing from us but every week we talk about how important it is that they wear their face coverings, that they get their temperature screen, that we're sticking to these protocols and that they're all staying six feet away. Because if we end up having to quarantine an entire building or an entire shift, that uh, one, I mean, I'm worried about my employees, but I'm also very worried about business continuity. So that's probably what keeps me up at night. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. a great point. And, and, you know, with OMEP on the agenda today too, I mean, I know that's some, some of the resources they've had available. Mm -hmm. The businesses yeah. and the manufacturers particularly is looking at that business continuity planning um, mm -hmm. so the, the supply chain piece and also just the layout of your production floor to be sure that there's uh, um, you know you're, you're doing the best you can to try to protect uh, the workforce and the employees um, sure. all right well I've got got you while well, you've got the floor here we did get a question in um, someone was asking about a deck did you assess your risk model and use insurance to supplement the unexpected loss of revenue yeah, we didn't use insurance. I mean, if it had been sustained, we, you know, have had, fortunately, a pretty quick dip in recovery. Um, we didn't use insurance, but we have been obviously looking at our, our risk model and our long term business continuity and, and strategy and scenario planning based on what could happen in the future. So yeah, we're definitely um, not, uh, we're, we're trying to prepare the best that we can not knowing what's coming. That's great. Um... Hopefully, I've got Mike and, and Jasmine still on here because I think one of these questions may be better for OMEP. Um, uh, we had a question. So I'm interested to hear how other manufacturers are responding to the face covering requirements uh, of, the, of public facing businesses. Um, are there businesses that are electing to follow the mandate even if they're not required or defined by the rule? Um, I think they're looking to see if also if anyone is electing face shields instead of fabric face coverings. I don't know if we still have uh, OMEP on the line or there's other folks that want to address that question. Yeah, Eric, I'm here. This is my, um, you know, um, you know, with our staff spread, spread, spread throughout the state. I mean, there's definitely a, a degree of, um, of, of different approaches being used. Um, I would say most, most manufacturing facilities um, are definitely implementing the, you know, social distancing um, and are making the appropriate changes for that. Um, until recently with the governor's orders that, you know, masks are, are required, you know, statewide, uh, there were some facilities not, uh, uh, you know, not utilizing masks, but, but they were putting the, you know, social distancing you know, protocols, uh, um, you know, in place. From what I'm hearing is uh, manufacturers are, um, are requiring masks, um, you know, along with the social distancing, especially with the governor's order of, uh, recently. Um, I can say I've only been in two facilities where I've seen shields used, um, either in combination with a mask or, or um, instead of the mask. But uh, certainly the social distancing and the masks. And I'm happy, oh, go ahead, Mariah, please. I'm just happy to answer how we're using shields because we've actually sent out guidance for our employees. Um, we originally recovered some sort of fabric face covering or a mask for everyone. Um, a, we've started to relax that a bit to allowing face shields. Um, the, the scientific evidence on them is 
split. Some people say it's more effective. Some people say it's not as effective if you look at kind of the academic literature. But um, what we are finding is we don't want to create one safety hazard for another and people who are working in heavy machinery all day or they're wearing uh, safety glasses that was fogging the safety glasses to the point that their vision was getting blurred or areas where there's loud machinery. They couldn't read each other's lips and we're trying to get closer together than we want them to be to be able to actually see. So in the kind of those scenarios, if they work in a loud building where they can read each other's lips uh, it easier and be able to keep distance, we're allowing it in areas where they have to wear some sort of eye protection as well. We're allowing it because of the fogging. So that's, oh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's interesting to hear how you're doing a first, first person there. And we did, um, what I was going to mention is uh, to Mike that um, in your comments that uh, you had some videos that showed mm -hmm. how, uh, or some presentations on the OMAP site that shows how people are preparing, how businesses are prepared and layout of floor plan and that sort of thing. Um, and Jen was the step ahead of me and she actually posted on a link here in the Q&A. So if folks are or in the chat room. So if folks are looking for that uh, resource on the OMAP webpage, the uh, link is there. Um, I hope you have a question from the ever inquisitive Asha Stone, who I know you know well. Um, she was asking if you have concerns about long term supply chain issues in the food industry or if you have any updates to offer in that arena. Well, um, <clears throat> well, that is a very good question. Um, well, we have, you know, uh, you know, we have a, I think, you know, all, all of the, the food industry, they're, they're you know, so somehow having a very difficulty with their, you know, uh, the inventory that is supposed to go out, you know, uh, before or during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And, and, you know, we had, you know, all those cancellation and, and, and we, you know, um, we had to, you know, hold those inventory or raw material uh, that was supposed to go out, but, you know, we still holding it. And I, uh, we, however, you know, we, you know, we talked to, um, you know, a couple, you know, a couple of, you know, uh, retail or distributor uh, that are, you know, try to, you know, support, um, you know, those inventory uh, with, uh, you know, um, very minimum, you know, um, uh, cost, you know, uh, for them. Uh, but, you know, it's better than material. So, you know, I'm happy to, to share that information, you know, um, if, if, you know, if uh, anybody uh, want, want, wants that information. Okay, thank you. I did have a question for the group here. Um, one last one, because we're running a little, a little past one o'clock here. With the quick industrial conversion from heavy equipment to PPE, how are you managing your impact to the environment as far as disposal of raw materials? Have there been any impacts there um, you've had to negotiate? I could jump in. Uh, so what I found and what we found is making it disposable at this point with not a lot of lead time and a lot of research and development time, you have to take what is off the shelf first. And then, then you set a plan to make a reusable or a renewable version of it as you go down the road. So we've got the R&D early in the conversation started about how to make a disposable gown that could be more environment friendly. But right now we are not. It's, it's a straight disposable uh, you know, plastic based uh, product. Um, and we hope to get to a uh, one that could be easily uh, decomposed, but we're not there yet. Oh, thank you. Well, I think, um, you know, we've covered a, a great amount of territory. So I'd like to thank our panelists here and thank you both for participating as well as thank your businesses for doing what you're doing and what you've done. I think we've, uh, uh, as we said in the introduction, we've all been inspired to see how you've been able to uh, adapt and uh, provide a real needed service and product uh, during a really difficult time. So thank you for being part of this. Um, I will remind folks that this is uh, recorded and there will be available up, uh, linked on our website. Um, you know, one of the things that Mike had mentioned during his discussion on OMAP, but I want to highlight also is that uh, you know, during this whole process, SEDCOR has uh, um, not only develop a stronger relationship with OMEP, but also our partners, the Atlanta Workforce Partnership and uh, the Community College and the Small Business Development Center. And I think we're all working together to try to uh, 
formalize that more so that we have a stronger we, we have a stronger relationship and offer a much uh, stronger uh, kind of common uh, voice to uh, businesses in the in the region. Um, so stay tuned for that. We are um, doing a follow a, a attempt another uh, one of our meetings in August. Um, we don't normally meet in the summertime, but uh, Seeing as everybody's kind of in the same boat, we're trying to keep people uh, engaged. So one of the opportunities uh, for us is to bring some new people to the discussion. In August, uh, our business uh, forum webinar will be on the 12th. And uh, we're bringing in our, our friends at the Technology Association of Oregon to be uh, uh, kind of give us an update on what they're doing. Um, present and future opportunities in technology around the state of Oregon, as well as, um, you know, highlighting what's going on with agriculture and tech and manufacturing. Um, TAO has been a partner in a lot of the work that uh, we've been doing in, uh, you know, Polk County and Independence and the region around ag technology and ag innovation. So um, um, they've, they've uh, got a real working knowledge of what the needs are in this region and uh, we're looking forward to having Kara Snow, their chief community engagement uh, um, uh, you know, person here to uh, share their information with us. So on that, I will thank uh, once again our great panelists for um, being part of this and I will uh, we'll be following up. I think there's some things we can be doing to continue this conversation with our uh, state and federal partners as far as uh, how we ensure um, local markets and local supply uh, um, is is prioritized uh, um, for us because I know that's something that we're taking very seriously as well. So thank everybody for attending, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, on screens in the future in August. So thank you all. Thank you be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.